Hello and welcome to the New Books Network. I'm Pierre Delance. Labour has taken an about turn. From Adam Smith's proposal for specialisation, which saw the factory line reorganised so that each worker needed only to know and understand a small aspect of the production process, many industries now rely on access to specialised skills and resources that are commanded ad hoc in discrete time and output bound chunks. This is the logic of projects. The workforce no longer dedicates itself to the making of a singular commodity, as was the case with Smith, but bids for discrete pieces of work when those are in demand. In some industries, for example in the art world, the workforce is also charged with building the demand for the work by initiating the project itself, which would then employ them. The ABC of the Projectariat, a new book by Kuba Schreder, contributes new thinking on and practical responses to the widespread problem of precarious labour in contemporary art. It is both a critical analysis and a practical handbook speaking to and about the vast cohort of artistic freelancers worldwide. Kuba Schroeder is an abandoned curator and a lecturer at the Academy of Fine Art in Warsaw, and I'm happy that he joins me now to discuss his work. Kuba, welcome to the show. Hi, hello. Nice to be here with you. Kuba, I'm, I'm really looking forward to our conversation for a couple of reasons. One, I haven't really interviewed anyone about dictionary so far, so this might take us in a very straightforward route. We go from A to Z, because that is the form your book takes. And two, and this is a trigger warning for both you and for our listeners, I disagree with you on quite a few things that you say in your book. But I'll hold that back, at least the latter bit of my excitement, for a little moment. And let's start by finding out a little bit about who you are. Oh, well, I'm not sure whether you really want to listen to my entire life story. Well, we can do, uh, we can do. I mean, where were you born? This is not (laughs) as interesting. I started uh, with doing a BA and MA at Jagiellonian University in Krakow in late 90s. I did it in sociology, social sciences. And I think that this background told me a bit about uh, stuff that you possibly also want to talk about. So social structures, uh, class analysis, uh, who is who, what is, uh, for example, high taste uh, and... uh, uh, what is a class distinction and stuff like this. I made my um, MA thesis in um, Pierre Bourdieu, in fact. Uh, and then, to be frank, I thought, oh no, do I really want to make an academic career? I, I thought, well, it's a bit boring. Let's let's just do cultural projects. And I was also involved in a couple of squads, like a bit of uh, punk, organizing a punk concert here or there, and uh, doing uh, later on quite a lot of uh, socially engaged um, Art, community art, mostly. In fact, not not even with a vi- in, within visual arts, but more with like a, with a one tree theater troupe. So doing workshops with kids in small um, industrial district of Krakow, which is called Nova Huta. Basically, it's called mm-hmm. New Steelworks. And back then, we are talking about early two thousands. I just realized that organizing all these community arts really doesn't make any sense. It just patches over all the structural problems of Polish economy and neoliberal onslaught mm-hmm. that Poland went through in early uh, 90s. And that instead of asking, like, you know, trying to uh, presume uh, that there is something wrong with these kids, that they need some sort of a socialization uh, workshop, yeah. you actually need to think about the structures that uh, led them to this place in the first instance. And then I started to organize more, I think, research-based artistic projects, uh, one of them being industrial town futurism, which was like mid-2000, that basically um, ended up with a reader, unfortunately not available in um, English. But then uh, the reader was actually uh, consisting of a quite a chunk of uh, Marxist-inclined social theory on the industrialization, semi-peripheries, uh, on the uh, things that, uh, that were related to uh, to the different also class divisions between people who are uh, pampered as uh, former industrial classes and the new middle classes of uh, of the new Poland. Mm-hmm. And clearly disagreeing with it, like, how the things uh, went. And and then I started to make a lot of projects, you know, like because I became a freelancer, I didn't have any position, I was working in a bar, kind of typical stuff possibly. Uh, and But like think about this typical in a kind of, post-transition Poland, where working in a bar means that you earn maybe one pound per hour or something. And uh, doing a cultural project means that you get like 500 pounds per year. And so uh, doing uh, this kind of work for a few years, I thought it's absolutely and utterly ins- unsustainable, kind of unsustainable mm-hmm. in the terms of like, well, you do not get enough money to pay your rent or stuff, right? Then I went, I thought, uh, 
maybe this is a good time to come back to academia. This is one thing, but also <laughs> in um, like to find any kind of semblance of any sort of stability, right? Uh, in a feat of self-preservation. And then also, I think I started to really lack this type of sustained, prolonged reflection upon what we are actually, what the heck are we here, are we doing here? I guess that like this sentiment is uh, pretty familiar to quite a few people who are doing projects. So, you know, yeah. like, but you need to run from one project to another. You just like have constantly, like continuous, like flurry of deadlines. Basically, you do not even know why do you do this or that after a while because uh, you accept one thing, but you definitely need to stay tuned and um, make uh, yet another project on some sort of yet another topic yeah. or some kind of festival or whatever. I uh, started to look for the different PhD programs, uh, ending up in the Loughborough School of the Arts uh, that was kind enough to provide me with a stipend. And then also I started to work on uh, Free Slow University of Warsaw yeah. With a bunch of uh, my uh, friends and comrades and people who are doing a lot of uh, things re in relation to basically Marxist critique of all the new capitalism or like this kind of weird version of the semi peripheric uh, capitalistic amalgam that we experience here in Poland. For me, it was uh, reflecting upon artistic production in the wider social context. But I think that for my uh, friends like Janek Sova, Michał Murawski, uh, Joanna Figiel, it was more considering art as a laboratory of new forms of exploitation, basically, or like right. new forms of capitalist management and new forms of, uh, of how, how in the, this new spirit of capitalism, art-related or project-related work is being used to, to subsume uh, all the forms of discipline with new forms of control. Mm. Okay, so I think this is a really good introduction, which I think some of our listeners will be able to sympathize with. It's kind of funny when you started talking, my first impression was like, okay, you're going to present yourself as a serial dropout. Like you came into academia, then you, then you left, then you, then you went in the art world, realized that it wasn't very really as giving. But I think the important thing here is to realize that this is a reality for so many people who over the last 10 years have been going through various attempts at participating in academia. But as you had discovered in the art world has been part of the existence for quite a lot of people who we refer to as art workers for a lot longer. But to get a little bit into your book, as I already intimated, the book is structured as a kind of ABC. So we have D being for dark matter, but also for deadline. E is for exclusion, but also for exodus. W is for wages, and so on and so on. And within all those chapters, you give a bleak, sometimes humorous, but I think mostly depressing picture of how this part of the art world that we have just intimated at works. So before we get into all of this, I want to ask you to define a couple of things. One, which part of the art world we're talking about and how the term projectariat enters into your thought about the art world. And second, um, also I want you to, to reflect right at the beginning so we understand this methodology a little bit, your status within the art world or also outside it? Well, all the exercises in self-positioning are frankly not very easy things to do. <laughs> I think for two reasons. One is that like, it's very hard to position an individual in kind of in sociological terms. It's much easier to mm -hmm. position groups of people, especially also that we are all, uh, I think, part of the many um, social worlds in the same uh, time. And, uh, and then there, are this, uh, there is this overdetermination of the social world, which basically means there are many factors that defines our positions. And I also try to discuss in a book some of these uh, factors, like it might be a class privilege, but what does it mean class privilege uh, when we think about relations, uh, like geopolitical relations, like uh, a person privileged uh, from, uh, that comes from outside of the Western uh, Europe is clearly much less privileged than a less privileged person who has a um, citizen rent uh, coming from a Nordic country, for example. Mm -hmm. Just to give you one example, then, you know, like yeah. then comes uh, the entire uh, gender uh, issue, which is also, uh, uh, frankly, one of the determinant factors in who uh, makes it in the neoliberal uh, art world. Uh, so then, unless you want me to uh, come up with some sort of self critique, uh, like uh, <laughs> and uh, get into my family story. Uh, but I don't uh, think but, you need to. I'll, I'll perform a critique of you later on. With you. Uh, yeah, I'm sure that you will. I mean, you can start with this now. I mean, like, why to? Because then you put me on a hook and then you say, oh, you, you know, you see Kuba Dia, 
uh, here we are, like you know, you said this, and I think that I, th- I uh, think I uh, think we we possibly we're, we're possibly <laughs> risking having too private a conversation. And Cooper and I have only met online about half an hour ago, so so let's true, let's, true, I'm, I'm pretty to anything. Let's go back to the book, Cooper. <laughs> okay, what good. is a projectariat, and which part of the art world do we really refer to? You know, this also unfortunately hugs back a bit to my personal story. Because, like, possibly what you allude to by saying mm. that this is like kind of inside outside uh, situation, yep. or like insider outsider, of a uh, what you implied by saying like uh, this real dropout. Actually, in fact, currently, uh, that maybe it's also important information is I have a stable position, uh, like after this uh, fifteen or twenty years of uh, freelancing. Um, right, I mean, congratulations the, uh, if that if that is what you what you what <laughs> what you wanted. Uh, no, but then uh, it's just a disclaimer, <laughs> uh, talking about structures of privilege and so on, right? Uh, so I feel, do feel actually pretty privileged uh, teaching at the Art Academy uh, in Warsaw, uh, which uh, which is a pretty uh, pretty interesting uh, mm-hmm. workplace. Uh, but then uh, talking about this uh, position of the of this particular section of the art world, uh, this is not necessarily even about a section of the art world, but about a specific arrangement of social structures of production that is quite mm-hmm. prevalent throughout the society. So these two things can intersect in one way or another. So, for example, what I mean, because it all sounded very abstract, uh, is that the people work on projects in many different uh, walks and ways of life. So academia, I came back from Tel Aviv, where we made also a presentation of the ABC of Projectariat. And then uh, we talked uh, with one researcher who is already uh, getting to her retirement age, who told me, you know, Kuba, like for the most of my life, and she's a bio. Uh, she's a bio engineer. For the most of life, my life, I worked on projects. I've never mm-hmm. had a, a like a stable job in uh, in my entire uh, career, right? And then uh, she said also like most of the things that you describe here uh, could be very easily applied to uh, to the way I used to work and I still work. This type of 0.2, 0.5, 0.4 contracts, a kind of very intermittent mm-hmm. forms of engagement typically structured in terms of like uh, projects. What does it mean? But basically a thing starts and ends, not in a sense of like a uh, lifetime project, which might start uh, like, you know, like Satian lifetime project yeah. or uh, like Hegelian or project of the grand new uh, society or communist project. It basically starts and ends in a matter of like one, two, three, four, maybe five years, if you are extremely yeah. lucky. And then there are sections of the art world, or like well, whatever, I have like a problem with calling it the art world, because I also, but this is a bit different story. I also believe in the multiplicity of the social worlds that mm-hmm. at the end compose what we uh, uh, call the art world. I also prefer to, because for this reason, I prefer to talk about artistic circulation, but are more project reliance yeah. than others. So, for example, if you think about, let's say, a small community art center when they are still funded, they possibly still need to apply for projects, but then they have a couple of stable jobs and they basically run classes with kids and so on and so forth. So possibly even there, most of the things are very intermittent and precarious. People still need to yeah. apply. People apply to EU, EU funding. Whenever they can apply, they, they do. If you have a art collective, like or whatever, some kind of art activist campaign or something like this, typically they also have uh, traces of the project uh, work in there. So even if they are, uh, if they operate on a regular basis, they have, for example, a squatted art center. Whenever they organize a concert exhibition, whatever type of output, even a campaign or like an action or an event or a demonstration, is typically organized uh, in terms of a project. So basically, you collect dormant resources, you call your friends, you say, okay, let's do this stuff together. Then it has a clear beginning and the end, or at least there is this peak of activity that that is organized in a project-like manner. If we think about events like shifting from this kind of like bottom end of the of what we would call artistic pyramid or, or hierarchy to the top end, of course, if you organize a huge sales in uh, in the auction house, it may be a project in itself. But of course, uh, the whole things are like art fair and so on. Clearly, it is organized as a project. But in terms of its economies, uh, they are not project oriented. Project is just a mean to organize a sale or organize a you know, get together like collectors, get together galleries, get together. It's like a, as a like managerial tool. But in fact, how they operate in terms of its economies, of course, they do not apply for funding or something because the economies are reliant on the huge uh, sales uh, in auction um, on the auction floor, right? Uh, you run the private, uh, you run a, a gallery, right? So then, of course, you will possibly you had like a couple of different uh, economies at uh, place. So one thing yeah. would be just organizing an event. 
which possibly would be project like event in a sense of like collating and and getting people together, uh, making press releases and so on. On the other hand, there was this always underlying economies related to maintaining um, connections with artists, maintaining trying to uh, find patrons and so on. And if you have like large institution, art institutions like museums or contemporary art centers or something like this. Uh, they clearly do have stable institutional structures, but in order to maintain their operations, they typically organize projects. And this is actually a very convenient way for most of them to uh, also uh, cut on the costs if you compare it to the uh, museums yeah. of old, so to say, uh, that were based on uh, permanent collections and permanent displays of collections. Uh, currently, uh, there is a completely different set of expectations when it comes to running uh, any type of museum which includes organizing a lot of temporary exhibitions, which are basically projects, but also uh, rehangs, uh, continuous rehanging of the uh, main exhibition, and then also uh, hiring up a lot of intermittent or temporary or part-time or zero hours uh, contractors in order to uh, sustain the operation. Uh, so mm. I think that in this sense, you can say that there is this um, uh, very small section of the what you would call the art world, that would be possibly reliant on the projects or on this freelance labor. But in terms of a section of people who really try just to apply for funding and get uh, get their lives sorted in this way, it may not be uh, so huge. But then I think there are a lot, a lot of operations that are organized as uh, projects that create this uh, vast social uh, strata of what Cholet calls dark matter. Hmm. I think what becomes interesting at this stage is the distinction between the projectariat or rather the project mode of production and what is innocently referred to as the sharing economy, that is the Uber or the Airbnb mode of production in which privately owned resources that lay dormant are mobilized for the benefit of both the corporation and the owner of these resources. Now, of course, there are a couple of quite stark differences here. Um, one is that the projectarian doesn't necessarily have access to or own any resources or any capital per se. But the other thing that really strikes me here is that in the case of the projectariat, there is no clearly defined demand. There is no clearly defined customer. So whereas Uber or Airbnb allow the transaction between a provider of a service and a customer to take place with the projectariat, that's not necessarily the case. The projectarian has to create their own demand. So to get into some of the keywords, some of the terms in the book, I wonder whether we could start trying to explain why it is that the projectarian is drawn to produce and overproduce, whether there is demand for it or not. Now, I thought that your explanation would have been F is for fear of missing out, but that entry is missing in the book. Actually, fear of missing out, if I ever do the second edition, I've already joked like the Mark Hebs when he wrote his review, he, he said, oh, the book is missing, P is for poetics. And I said, well, true, possibly if I will ask you, Mark, to write another entry on this, possibly if it is a multi-author book, I will ask you to write something about BMC and professional managerial class or, or <laughs> uh, about, uh, you know, about... FOMO, this is another thing that actually I also told mm. that uh, would be a good time to be uh, put into a, a book. Uh, but this also is a bit, bit humorous, but maybe also like a bit of a stem project projectariat and about the whole reflection. Because I think there is, yeah. what I didn't say is that like the book came out of the PhD. PhD, as you typically know, is like you write one on yourself now, right? It's a, it's a kind of uh, a pretty dull academic prose. Then, uh, just after I finished it, I was, uh, in fact, I got a grant, a stipend from uh, the Polish Ministry of Culture to translate the book into, uh, into Polish. In my PhD, I use the term project maker. What happened? Like, you know, like just try to find out some sort of term to cover mm -hmm. this cohort of people. And then a, a friend from Frisla University came to me, Siobhan Zidek, and he said, oh man, but why don't you call these guys projectariats? We are all projectariats here. Projectariat in Polish, basically. Yeah. And it was actually a quiet, uh, informal conversation. It wasn't a conference. It wasn't anything like that. And out of this kind of intellectual exchange or like some sort of like also just, you know, swapping words and and, uh, and, jo and trading jokes, uh, a couple of terms emerged, like artisol as well. And not only that, I also like Pata institutions, in fact. And also they emerged in the process of mistranslations or translations and mistranslations. <laughs> In this fact, we talked a bit about at the beginning um, how to pronounce my name uh, because I'm Polish and clearly uh, English my second language. So then, mm -hmm. like in this book, I tried to make a you know a couple. I made a couple of jokes about this uh, 
semi-peripheric revenge on the dominant uh, language of artistic debate, which is clearly uh, this type of international English that we speak, which is uh, possibly for our native speakers also a bit painful sometimes well, to listen. Could, could, then, could we well, do that? Could we could we dis- dis- dispense with some of this privilege and let you talk about one of the definitions? And I'm I'm pretty sure this is the one thing the one thing that people ask you about all the time in conversations about the book, partly because it's it's an A. It's under A, so it comes quite close. One doesn't even have to have got halfway through the book before this morsel comes, comes it. But it, in line with my question about what it is that makes the art world or the aspect of the art world that we're talking about special, in inverted quotes, as in worthy of attention, as a prism through which to think about class relations, the word art is all comes up. And that's a portmanteau of something that's very Polish and something that's not Polish. So please take it away. If you want to answer in Polish, I'll get someone to translate and dub it over. I don't particularly mind, but... Nah, that's not, that's is, not, this is not necessary. So uh, when we talked about artisan with Andrea Phillips, she said that this reminds her of appeals that her mom uh, could have taken in like uh, somewhere in a small town in England, in, like in fifties or sixties. They're kind of like, oh, you take artisol, it's a wonder pill. Uh, you have a like headache mm-hmm. or a depression, you basically take it, and it makes you uh, happy. Uh, but mm-hmm. uh, it came out of our discussions with the Free Slow of uh, University of Warsaw when we made a uh, research back in uh, mid 2010s, 2015, I think it was, about the relations of work in. Um, the Polish field of contemporary art. And and then, you know, like, I think that for ev- anyone who is a part of this uh, art-related something, uh, it's always a wonder why all these people really want to make the artworks, art exhibitions, write all these articles, go to Venice Biennale, just do all these things, even though it is uh, for them impossible to sustain themselves economically mm. with this activity which is clearly the case. I mean, it is not related to projects, I think, though projects trade on this. Uh, we can come back to this uh, later yeah. because it's part of the, the good old bourgeois mystique of art in general. Uh, or like uh, it harks back definitely uh, to the beginnings of the uh, field of art uh, in, uh, and the kind of the whole notion of art for art's sake. It's not project specific. It's more art specific in this sense that uh, artists are well known to this price, or like at least in terms of uh, how, how this mistake operates, of this kind of bohemian set of uh, art values um, emerged uh, once again in the kind of like, let's say, 19th century, uh, is that like uh, art is considered as something more valuable, uh, at least more fulfilling uh, than other uh, traits and works of life. So you have this uh, drudgery of uh, industrial work or some sort of money mm. grabbing of the bourgeois. Uh, and then you have these artists who have free spirits and they do commit to their own art. Uh, or like they write pro- poetry or they make paintings and so on. At least that's how mystic goes because, of course, it is mysticizing. Like, in fact, I think I wouldn't, uh, from the soci- sociological perspective, artists always, always were uh, very much um, also fixated with how to make their money and they were not very happy living poor and so on and so forth. Yeah, that, 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 that the Bohemian myth is indeed a myth. Like yeah, a, lot, a, lot, a, myth. a lot of the people that we look at from either the pre-Raphaelites or the Romantics or, or, or Paris yeah. were actually either either wealthy or they died poor. And there's exactly the, the sooner we happy. stop telling kids at the art school that, that this is a good yes. good idea, the the better. And I contend that we still do. Uh, this is one of my functions in the art school when I teach sociology of art. I mean, this is an, an ungrateful task to be a sport sport. Mm. You do not want to, I mean, you possibly uh, know it uh, very well. You try to um, you try to do it uh, professionally uh, as well. Uh, and then um, at least say, saying to people, oh, you shouldn't be, and uh, you know, you shouldn't be so fixated on all this uh, artistic freedom. So like this kind of like mystic of, uh, of romantic mystic of art. Uh, and I guess that uh, anyway, young people, do make their own minds and they just uh, but I think that they should be quite well aware of the uh, cruel economy of arts to which uh, in which they are going to operate because this economy is definitely cruel uh, we can talk about it uh, a bit later but then like talking about this artisan because this was a question right so then we came up with this uh, kind of uh, half joking um, term to cover this uh, fixation on artistic activities uh, but this is like very well re- researched and rehearsed. 
uh, that uh, people basically, when they uh, can't have big rights about it, for example, when people are, uh, or artists, or like people art inclined, curators included current. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is also an interesting thing that curators are, the more uh, curating become a prestigious job, the less curators actually add. And so then we came up with this artisan, which in Poland is actually related to a bug spray from the 70s, which was called Muhozo. So it was something that... No, an, uh, an insecticide, used... yeah. Yeah, yeah mm. insecticide, exactly. Yeah. So that is something that was used to kill flies or something like this, and then connected it with art. And then when I was writing the Polish, uh, the English version of this book, I thought, well, shall I actually, because this artisan doesn't... Uh, the, you know, translate in this sense that this is, sounds weird, right? I mean, like nobody knows what uh, what this is clearly, and because it doesn't exist, um, uh, so there are good reasons for not knowing what it is. But then I was thinking, okay, shall, shall I find a new name for this? And then I was like uh, browsing and thinking, oh, maybe Artoho. But then I came up with the article written by Charles Sachi, uh, in which it was written, "I'm Charles Sachi and I'm Artoholic." And then I thought, oh no, no way to go there. <laughs> There is no, no chance that I'm going to have like A is for alcohol in my in my book and then started mm. with a reference to uh, Charles Sachi. So I decided to keep this artisan as just a bit of a, you know, just a joke. I've, I think this is a really, really important joke to think about as we as we go into other aspects of, of the projectariat. And well, the thing that you do with this term is you, you kind of place the responsibility for what goes wrong in the projectariat? Kind of right, right in the middle. On the one side, we have this idea that art is a higher calling, or that creativity is a human right, as as you know many official charters claim, and that's all very good. On the other, we have this thing that oh, you know, capitalism is bad, and you part of this kind of gig economy now. We've warned you. So to paraphrase Zizek, they know it's not good for them, but they keep doing it, kind of thing. And that's that's the thing at which I start kind of really. A little bit going away from nodding along with you because we're looking at a population that is now global that has absorbed and replicated models of production models of financing models of struggle um, also attitudes towards what it is that art should be for including like the, the complete proliferation of um, social practice and politically engaged practice so it's a global population that should know that this doesn't really work but there is all the same, absolutely no way out. You described earlier in a conversation a way in which, in what is to me a really, really concrete example of neoliberalism, how it isn't even the individuals who are part of this kind of project practice, but it is entire institutions. So whereas in the UK, we would have had quite a long tradition now of the Arts Council, which I think probably from the very early 2000s, Arts Council England would have been really open up for individual bids. You, know, you want to do a solo show, you want to have a curatorial collective, you can get a tiny bit of money. But what you're describing it on a state level is essentially an art center, which already needs to have significant assets and employ people bidding for EU funds. And you know, EU funds is still a kind of thing in inverted commas. It's still, it's still really the specter of neoliberalism. It's telling you resources are there, they're just not yours if I can, can make a question out of this, is, is where it is that we go beyond the analysis of the clearly unpleasant side effects of this kind of operation and the consciousness of the whole class of people, some of whom might be struggling artists, some of whom might be struggling, but also not so struggling art administrators, in relationship to that. And in particular, what interests me is the payoff the payoff with which we justify all of this, that goes beyond the bohemian. And now at the risk of making this a monologue rather than a question, I think that the payoff is that the projectariat think that they have some kind of exalted position which lets them decide what art and politics should be. Let's get them decide what the communities that they serve are in need of. Because the project is quite often starts with the idea we have this community, we need to bring them art, we need to bring them liberation through art. There's, of course, many different ways of phrasing this, and there's many different urgencies within that. So I want to add a third reason. We have the bohemian self-fulfillment, we have, it's like this because capitalism, and my third one is, I want to do it because it gives me the satisfaction of being this very special class of person. 
So just to make it clear to listeners, my, after my long monologue, the first two ideas I think are quite contained within your book, within your analysis. The third is my my disagreement with with the limits of what you what you've done. So is is the projectarian also like a terrible bureaucrat who wants to push the the goods onto everyone else? Well, the whole argument of the book is at least at, at how I tried to uh, formulate it or how I uh, I hope it uh, it transpires is that basically the only way out for projectarians is to stop thinking that they are somewhat special if they mm-hmm. if anybody thinks that they are but it might be also very specific you know because uh, I have uh, worked also with a lot of artistic trade unions at least in Poland most of the people with whom I work less inclined to emphasize their own uh, special position and rather uh, more inclined to think about how they relate to other social groups and uh, underlying in a kind of like political groundwork the um, similarities uh, between uh, the different groups of precarious uh, workers mm-hmm. in Poland. This was at least the kind of like the trust of the uh, most of the campaigns that, uh, that I have been part of. To emphasize that there are similarities in like that... Uh, that relate, for example, to the lack of social security, lack of access to the health insurance, which in Poland is prevalent. If you do not, I mean, it's very specific. I do not want to get into details. Uh, to make it short, if you are on zero hours on like uh, or on the short-term mm-hmm. contracts, you do not uh, get access to health insurance, and neither you will have like pension fund. And then people try to say, okay, like we need to do something with uh, with the position of of temporary workers and uh, and artists uh, in Poland somehow. They need to be a way of dealing with this. But then there are also specificities in this sense that, of course, like then people quite often uh, hug back to this, possibly what is quite often criticized from the Marxist perspective, like that, this, that people say, okay, artists need special arrangements. Uh, uh, there, there is like, you know, UBI, like universal basic income for art. Uh, or like there is some sort of like special arrangement for artists because artists are special, they are more valuable than other types of work. I clearly think this is wrong. And I just mm-hmm. want to say, I just don't think, and also I despise this type of patronizing attitude that you have described. If anybody subsides, to, subscribes to this kind of uh, understanding of this, I definitely, I'm definitely not in, uh, uh, I wouldn't uh, be in that camp. I told you this story about this uh, Nova Huta. Of course, this is always yeah. a bit problematic in a sense of what you think is valuable, what you think is it's not, you know, possibly publishing a reader on, uh, on Nova Huda is not necessarily a something that people in Nova Huda back then wanted. But also as part of uh, as part of this exercise, we organized a seminar in the one of the contemporary art, gal- art galleries on the future of work, which possibly also was not something that lots of people from Nova Huda has attended. But then back in this day, which was like mid 2000s, there was a changing attitude in general to the problems of the cost of Polish transformation. And this part, mm. this type of artistic programs that we try to understand, like artistic research, intellectual programs, were kind of dissenting voices in the field of art and academia, whatever you want to make with it, right? Because then we can yeah. uh, get into the discussion of like class dynamics and like, for example, it's a, like a long, very long discussion, in fact, as long as workers' movement about the role of mm. intellectuals in the movement in general, like sure. kind of uh, yeah. in the party, et cetera, et cetera, right? To be a long debate, and I'm not certain now how relevant it also is, uh, like and uh, and how uh, how much we need to get into a a detail here. Um, then I guess also what I would disagree with you is that like re- reserving this type of critique to a very specific and I think very underfunded and a very marginalized uh, sector of the uh, artistic production, which is community based or educational educational work. If you think about artistic institutions, for example, how they operate, uh, mostly feminine uh, educational work is often, and like I think it's perennial, also throughout all mm. the artistic, uh, uh, artistic institutions, even if they consider themselves very progressive. Educational departments are the most precarious and the, less, uh, the least uh, respected uh, departments in, uh, yeah. in artistic institutions. What counts is big names, uh, especially the ones uh, of people who already made it in the gallery exhibition nexus, and also people who already validated themselves on the art market and uh, organizing their exhibitions uh, that would uh, garnish, that would also ensure that these trajectories, both of curators and artists, uh, are maintained. 
I think that this is what counts. That's where resources go. That's where visibility is actually uh, focused on. And uh, all this the, the day-to-day grind of organizing workshops with kids or doing some kind of like uh, community work uh, is uh, typically very much neglected. Uh, but this is, uh, this is just uh, artistic institutions. And I think the same goes to whatever type of um, community-based uh, art uh, is organized on there. First of all, I think there is much less organized now than they used to be, also because of changes yeah. in the uh, in the funding funding structures that you have described. So basically, the big funding, even if they are organized uh, like the project related temporary structures, even more so, they go to bigger players. So it's much more likely that a, a central metropolitan institution is going to get backing of arts council rather than a small community arts center somewhere out there in Wales. Not only that, adding insult mm. to injury, possibly there will be a lot of metropolitan voices uh, bitching about, uh, sorry uh, sorry for a word, but like, you know, complaining about the general, uh, uh, that community art is uh, not nice or whatever, but it, that it patronizes people and so on and so forth. At the end, the community is uh, uh, depleted of resources and is depleted even of the presence of this, uh, of this type of uh, center. But as part of the social democratic um, Arrangement that was a welfare statish uh, arrangement that was uh, still present in in England by the 1980s, they would have had like a stable source of funding, and they would have. This is the key question, and you might you might have expected that this is where I'm going to go. One of my worries in the the argument that you've made, which I follow quite a long way, like particularly when it comes to community art, and I refer to community art in a meaning that's specifically distinct from socially engaged practice. I interviewed Francois Matarasso. Um, not so long ago on the program. I'll put a link in the show notes to for listeners to, who want to check that out. And he, while he has been misunderstood 20 years as someone who is promoting social practice, which is what artists do when they're commissioned to go into intervene in communities, he actually kept on wanting to talk about him and a bunch of people who did never been to a museum making art for themselves. Like that hasn't, that has, I contend that that has absolutely nothing to do with the art world per se. And to, to take that point home, I actually want to propose that there is a way in which the proliferation of social practice, that is this kind of trajectory from the art school into the project funded intervention in communities, usually a Ryanair flight away, you know, cheap, a budget airline flight away, that is part of a way in which the social or the welfare state has been undermined. When we used to have social workers, neoliberalism has paved the way for replacing the relatively expensive social worker with a much cheaper, but I'm afraid I think also a way more less effective artist. And, and the problem with where we've got to is that now we have such a mass of people engaged in this kind of social practice that, that is on the one hand really necessary because it serves communities that quite often have nothing. You talked about Nova Huta, this, this, this place outside of Krakow, and you admit, even though I don't necessarily need to dwell on this, it's, it's, you know, it's very good of you to, to acknowledge that some of these activities might not have been to the benefit of the community strictly. But I'm sure that you would have been doing both things at the same time. Now, the question comes to do with the balance. How much of this kind of activity serves the interest of communities? And then brackets, who are they? Are they the working class? Again, in, 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 in inverted commas. Or are these activities actually fueling the demand for art workers? And I would, I would, I would point out again that actually nobody is served well the communities are getting a rough deal because the social workers, the, co the community play centers are gone and the art workers are projectarians and they're not paid. So, so we, we're in a position where actually I wonder whether more artists, more attention on artistic activity and intervention is a solution. Yeah, possibly just as you uh, do with uh, my argument, I here also would follow you uh, to a, a certain point. Or like actually, I would like to move to a certain point where we actually mm -hmm. where we are talking only about this community-based uh, uh, art project. I think that this is a certain limitation that I would really recommend going to, to move, moving beyond. That's what I try to do, at least because I think it's part of the larger problem, which is how the resources are being distributed in our societies. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, and the uh, resources. If you want to see how the resources are being distributed, take a look at Christie's, Sotheby's, and uh, and mega yachts and uh, mega sales, or in the kind of provincial version to some sort of gallery weekends here or there. This is where surpluses are being located. Definitely, like you know, if you you are very well aware that even like a meat, uh, possibly a meat sale uh, in a kind of in a gallery system is uh, uh, larger than a project commission. Mm -hmm. That's why, um, and lots of people are doing this kind of like project related work because they do not have any other, I mean, they would have other choice, just go, go to uh, other uh, the fields of, uh, of life. They typically try to find the ways of like different forms of economic um, underpinnings and uh, a project really a commission based work, like this type of commission that you described is just a very small part of it. Like so possibly they need to rely on some sort of, um, uh, on um, I remember doing, actually, you asked about Katrin uh, Boom before, uh, remember doing workshops, uh, like kind of like mapping uh, of artistic economies uh, with different mm -hmm. people also in uh, Barking and Dagenham in, uh, in East End, London. It was a really nice project, and I'll add a link to information about it to the episode show notes. And then people were typically uh, drawing out some sort of like spider web of connections that enables them to maintain uh, whatever uh, they think is in the artistic practice and the artistic practice is clearly uh, the, the ways how art is being practiced there are like many many different uh, different ways how people think about that they, they might have the studio-based practice in which they try to produce something maybe with a hope of exhibiting it or possibly even less so with a hope of selling it because this is uh, generally speaking that's a very idealistic notion that you will uh, go and sell yeah. your artworks uh, very few people actually do it uh, then uh, you have, then they just also do a commission here or there, but this is also far in between. They possibly uh, are this type of precarious workforce related to artistic academia, but they might also rely on the uh, bits and pieces that come together with a community-based organization in the sense that you have, uh, but not a project in a sense, but rather like uh, yeah, yeah. you run classes, uh, drawing classes with kids in one of the community art, center, art centers, but it's still there and still kind of council funded uh, if, they, if it was not uh, slashed uh, during the austerity period. And in the same time, we do have, and it's not, not surprising, we do have like this new grand wings of the big art institutions uh, being opened in the in the metropolis. You have uh, grand openings, you have like uh, big sales and patron clubs who clearly uh, have uh, amassed such a um, you know uh, such a well that it's not a big problem for them to buy an art piece for a couple of million uh, pounds uh, so this i think this is where this is where my problem is with this kind of critique that we should work like we should think about this in like a larger picture and and then not to say that i actually do it so very much in a book because it is clearly focused on people working on projects so mm -hmm. I do not talk too much about um, gallery exhibition nexus and the critique of art market. Uh, it's not uh, very well uh, covered uh, in a book because the focus was different, which I think is also, uh, hopefully it's fair, uh, because I, uh, I do not try, like you suggested at the beginning, to present a book that will save the world. I just, I try to... Uh, to <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm to waiting for book. someone to write that, but it's, 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 it's a vain effort, I'm afraid. But, yeah, but, it, would, it would have been an yeah. extremely vain and rather mm. silly effort uh, if somebody uh, tries to write a book like that. But still, I'm definitely not the one. I just rather tried to come up with a couple of terms, not a, con not a comprehensive dictionary, uh, that covers uh, life and work and struggles of the group of people and also it has it is written with an aim of trying to maybe not necessarily persuade because books do not persuade but at least mm. outline to people the ways uh, to projectarians or other people who work in this uh, in this way some sort of cross-sectoral or cross-class alliances that might bring them to the position in which they do not fall for this double bind that you have so well described in a sense that you have uh, a uh, crumbling welfare state. We are talking about Western Europe because uh, other parts of the world welfare states did not ex exist, uh, and in Poland uh, vaguely. Uh, still, um, the crumbling uh, social infrastructures uh, that are covered up by some sort of patchy, intermittent, uh, temporary uh, work that rely on the underlying systems of privilege, because clearly people that do have to need to survive somehow is are not paid, right? They have to have some sort of resources being amassed. 
uh, and then um, uh, which might relate to the citizen rents, it might, it might relate to a product class privilege. And then, but this is a, a bad deal uh, for everyone, especially if we consider a long term perspective, which projects evacuate. Because I think that this is where the problem lies. Mm-hmm. The inequalities and uh, exploitations happen in the long term. That's where values are being sold, and that's where people actually do accumulate debt, do accumulate. Uh, uh, they have to uh, absorb the costs of their own um, aspiration. Uh, and, uh, mm. you know, like there is this saying that most of the middle classes in uh, in the metropolitan centers are like two mortgages away from like homelessness or something like that. Maybe this is a bit over over exaggeration. I don't know. But... I, don't, I don't think necessarily. I uh, necessarily. Uh, but I'm going to yeah. interrupt you and 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 ask sure, you sure. a different version of my question using your own your own terms. So I'm trying to to understand a little bit the importance of class consciousness within the field you 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 describe. And the potential for solidarities, and these are these are like solidarity in particular is a term that in the discourse of the art worker I think is quite quite present. So I completely take on board that there is a critique of um, critique of wealth accumulation that is actually completely standard. The art world is a beautiful example for any for in any any amateur Marxist analysis. We have inequality and the you know, the in the craziness of distribution of wealth and resources and and we have exploitation of this whole dark matter this term that you that you refer to from Gregor Scolette where a whole ch- chunk of this projectari- your projectarians are doing unpaid labor which manifests in wealth at the other end of the universe essentially in a way that no longer really follows this kind of worker worker empl- employer relationships but i'm interested in and in actually trying to figure out where on the class spectrum the projectarians lie and and I leave it up to you to tell me what you know which which class which class scale you want to use whether you want to you want to refer defer to marx whether you want to join me in talking about the the professional managerial class but i'm interested in not necessarily just the antagonism between the art worker and the collector class, because that's that's obvious. I mean, Marx already told us that is that has to happen. Even though I think you make an argument for why that is weakened in in the art world, I can see you're shaking your head. So so you can, you can take me to task over that in a second. But I'm also interested in the class relationship between the art worker and the community outside, and that also means the middle classes. It doesn't just mean the working classes, whoever they might be for whom the, the social artist maybe serves or doesn't. But also, I just want to figure out, like, w- what class do these artists refer to? They're poor, they're, you know, they're precarious. They're not driving the Uber taxi, but they're doing something equivalent. But also, they're highly educated. They, you know, the state spends money on educating and, you know, by the, by the back door, maintaining these, these populations. And I think we... To, to, we have to, at some point, kind of call it, call it a spade a spade. Are art workers workers in the sense that they are working class? And, and from there, the question of solidarity is really kind of, kind of important. Right. So maybe uh, starting from the moment where I started to sh- shake my head, which was this uh, kind of presumed conflict between uh, art workers and collectors class. I don't think mm. th- this is a, a right way of putting it. It was uh, typical, in fact, for the... 1960s for the uh, Art Workers Coalition. I think it was also my, one of the main mistakes. This is not about this, I think. There are uh, small sections of the uh, uh, of the artists, or like some very small sectors, or like of curatorial or institutional um, people who clearly benefit from the current neoliberal regime. It's not mm-hmm. artists versus collectors. It's like uh, celebrity artists who do hire 500 people in order uh, to paint, mm-hmm. uh, to turn out uh, thousands of paintings yearly. Uh, this, I think, is pretty clear in terms of uh, in Marxist terms because uh, this is already a capitalist enterprise in, in everything but name, you know, like this yeah. kind of like expanded artistic studio. It's actually interesting, like with this is a different uh, type of analysis, uh, how these production structures uh, differ or don't uh, from the previous phases of uh, artistic development, if we uh, want to call it in this way. In a sense, for example, art, uh, artistic workshops during the Renaissance or uh, something like this. I think there is something very similar in how they are organized rather than very disparate, like in the sense of you have a headmaster and then you have like all these uh, yeah. hands who are, uh, who are uh, working there. 
Then in terms of like, because you already uh, made, um, you said, are artists workers and other part of working class? The question is, how many what's workers... The, what's, the, current... what's the question? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a question. But this is the question also when we generally commit to any form of uh, more advanced uh, social analysis in especially a more advanced um, economy. Because uh, clearly you have the global division of labor and most of people who work in the economies of Western, uh, Western North do not fully subscribe to the classical Marxist definition of the proletariat in a sense of people who have to yeah. work because otherwise they would not be able to eat and they have to sell the workforce. And there's a basically labor force or like mm. labor in order to survive. They, uh, like, for example, home ownership is pretty high, especially in the boomers generation in the UK. This was one of the Thatcherite ways how to yeah. uh, dismantle class divisions, right? Uh, if you think about, um, but then most of people do have to work. It's not that they can't just rely on the welfare state. But the whole neoliberal neoliberal agenda was to make possibly also reverse some sort of uh, social transformations that has taken place for the last 70 years, but included the creation of the large middle classes in Western Europe. But interestingly, there was a, um, it was UK-based report on the uh, art and class. Very interesting research about uh, what were the class origins of um, of people who are in the arts? Oh, with you talking, uh, you're talking about two two things possibly. One is the book uh, "Culture Is Bad for You," which is actually co-written mm-hmm. by one of my co-hosts on the New Books Network, Dave O'Brien, and another book um, which I shamefully forget. Um, I'm, well, I'm, I'm going to recommend because there's something I actually wrote a review of uh, a book by Sam Friedman and a co-author on the, or, the exactly class origins of people working in media and elite professions. I shall put links to um, both these things sure. in the show notes. But then there is a, there was this analysis of how people from where people originate, uh, and clearly in 70s, um, clearly now there is much less people who originate from a working class. If by working class we uh, if working class is defined by the lack of education, which is also a quite presumptuous uh, uh, or like more sociological yeah. understanding of strata or class rather than uh, typically Marxist, right? Uh, and then, um, and then, but then this uh, report, as far as I under, as I remember, pointed out uh, to the general uh, change in the composition of the Western societies between 1970s, when the first cohort was being. Mm-hmm. Um, taken in uh, 2020, namely the vast advancement of the education in general. So basically, yeah. uh, quite a lot of people whose parents were working class uh, and who went into arts in 70s, this kind of like grand opening type of days when you had like uh, upward social mobility and so forth and so on, so on. The kids of these people are, cl- are now becoming also part of the art or, or academia or intellectual uh, production and so on. But then they are already middle class uh, in origin, but if you think about the longer time, uh, longer trajectories uh, of uh, quite a few people, uh, is possibly uh, is very possible that they do not come from kind of like aristocracy. They do not come uh, from the large uh, uh, bourgeoisie. They do not come from upper classes in this sense, but uh, from this uh, sort of mid strata, uh, which is also currently being hollowed out. I think, uh, like in a sense, that there are like uh, less and less uh, inclination. Uh, that uh, there's people who currently think about themselves as different from working class, which I yeah. think this is quite important, uh, would manage to reproduce themselves as a middle class if uh, in the current under the current political regime, which is uh, neoliberalism and the utter dominance of the very rich uh, the political political and economic dominance uh, of what occupies uh, called one uh, percent, which is of course very, a very misleading term and uh, and so on. But then on the other hand. Uh, at least um, it is handy uh, because it is out there and people do understand it. So this, I think, is very important also when it comes to thinking about projectaria. Because, of course, like, you know, uh, in a sense, there are like vast differences between a person who works in an assembly line and a, a person who chants out uh, a cultural project. But, on the other hand, interestingly, quite a lot of people who work in Amazon warehouses might have been the ones who tried to, who have actually higher education and uh, tried to make the living uh, like uh, out of humanistics or art or something like this. And uh, they um, have not managed to do it. I know quite a lot of examples of people who who actually are taxi Uber drivers or, um, 
or who are you, or who work in uh, services, uh, however uh, understood. I'm go- I'm going to suggest that maybe, despite my my great desire to to have an argument with you, we might be coming close to some kind of agreement. Maybe we're just not terminologically the same place. I'm I'm going to park this and just say that if maybe if listeners are interested in my argument for why artists might need to be considered as part of the PMC, the professional manager of a class, I can I can link an essay that I wrote on this. But actually, I think Kuba, we we're quite close. The the downward mobility of the highly educated class, which destabilizes the artists, the projectarians, understanding of the class allegiances, I think is part of the problem. And and terms like the PMC are super useful because actually this is something that we have already seen in places that have nothing to do with the art world. I have a feeling though that we're not doing a book that much, <laughs> that much um, justice in this conversation. So I want to drag us back into at least one of one of the two of those terms. I mean, this is. I think that this is. At least I hope that for the listeners, it will be as engaging. I think that a good conversation uh, prompted by a book uh, is not yeah. something that uh, I would shun. In fact, I think it's a. Uh, well, it's listen, a Kuba, you were you 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 were you were saying that you have a permanent position, but you're a projectarian still. I want to give you an opportunity to sell your project. <laughs> yeah. right. So let's lo- <laughs> let's look at let's look at the index. You talk about the short termism of the project, which is, of course, in the context of this kind of class antagonism or any kind of political consciousness raising that we might want to develop, is the killer. This is the neoliberal fix. You know, we, we never have more than five minutes to figure out who it is that's causing us, us trouble and, and putting us where we are. The art world is very good at being intellectual. We know precisely what the problems are. Like your book in the end is a, is a it's sort of testament to the fact that we do know what the problems are. But what we don't have is a format, formats or spaces in which solutions, some of which might be reformist, some of which might be radical, in which those actually come to fruition. In that context, I'm interested in particular in the uh, practice of the slow university, which you, you are part of. And, and I, I want you to reflect on the way in which time works in and between projects. Actually, I don't know which entry this is for. Uh, a couple. In fact, a couple. There is an entry on time machine. There is an entry on uh, social struggles. There is an entry on Frisco University of Warsaw, which, in fact, uh, is already part of my past rather than of my uh, present. Uh, but then I think that uh, I've already alluded to, uh, to it. Uh, there were initiatives, and there still are initiatives, uh, that try to build this kind of... Um, Solidarities, uh, I would say, and operate mm. in a long term perspective, such as uh, in Poland, like Artistic Trade Union, Citizens Forum for Contemporary Art, but in its uh, best days when there were like a lot of people who were able to commit, also organize a lot of solidarity or like tries to contribute uh, to solidarity actions with uh, striking workers, for uh, instance, but then like uh, workers from the various industries. And then it mutated into, in Poland at least, uh, into the uh, very profound wave of unionization in various artistic institutions and uh, at academies and universities, which does not mean, might not mean a lot, but still it means that there are like uh, some forms of social organization or like some kind of like social consciousness, but there is a problem Mm. that cannot be resolved on an individual basis and it requires some kind of like union that will also operate not only in... um, in a short term, but actually will be able to address uh, more uh, structural problems. Uh, but saying this all, unions in general, at least in countries like Poland and also possibly in countries like UK, do have a very, very limited power. There were like yeah. a lot of, um, uh, like somebody like actually I think Warren Buffett said, there was there is a class war and we win it. I mean, like, uh, oh, and we are winning it, right? And then the unions uh, are decimated in a sense that there are like a lot of problems with uh, establishing a union, not only in Amazon warehouse, but also in uh, university. Or the union reps being sacked, like it is uh, currently a couple of formerly critical currently entrepreneurial mm-hmm. universities in uh, London. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of union busting being uh, conducted. Right, that's why unions are problematic because there are like also project related work was in fact invented as at least maybe precarious forms of work, zero hours temporary type of uh, work, were invented and popularized. Not necessarily on the one hand responding to the demands of people who wanted to live more creative, self fulfilling, self dependent lives, but it all turned out very quickly into a 
hell of kind of job centers or or into a hell yeah. of uh, people just not being able to stay in one place long enough to build this kind of friendships and trust that is necessary to pull out any type of serious social action. You do not go to a barricade or you do not make a strike if you do not trust your people. You do not trust your people if you just meet them once in a while and then you are moved somewhere else. This is a whole uh, nightmare of precarity. That's why there is mm-hmm. this flexibilization being involved. It's not necessarily the reason, it's not really economic in a sense that there are like some efficiencies uh, because uh, there might be an argument that actually it costs even more to maintain this kind of flexible structure because you need to, for example, pay intermediaries. You need to work to pay the mm-hmm. job agency as an employer, right? Or you just cannot rely on the skill set or something like this unless they are completely uh, irrelevant. Like it might be, you thought about this, you said about this downward mobility in uh, in academia, possibly a lot of the skill sets that were uh, believed to be very important, uh, in fact, proved to be uh, irrelevant, especially when you have like automatization yeah. or, or e-teaching and so on. But uh, the, coming back to, to this uh, point is that this uh, were implemented for a reason, actually, to prevent people from unionizing. Artists are also not very special in this sense, though in art you also have this mystique that is related to the art per se, which is this uh, very studio work, very individualistic. People just want to do, uh, are interested in their own stuff. They're always busy. This is an interesting thing. <laughs> but even if people do not add, yeah. they're always busy. I can, you know, like the statistics are very weird. Like people, uh, when there was like a larger survey being made in, in Poland, uh, artists were being asked, so how many, how many hours per week they work? They said 50. And when they were uh, asked, so how many of these hours are paid? They say 15 of, or 10. <laughs> yeah, right. You have this like this position, what we do now as well. I mean, we are so clearly like, you know, I'm so in, in, invested, clearly invested in my project enough to spend Friday afternoon um, talking about uh, it's, it's, my it's, book. It's very, very good of you, Kuba. I mean, there will be no reward, I'm afraid. <laughs> exactly. I'll, I'll send you a box of chocolates. Except, <laughs> except, of course, no, come on. Like, uh, the pleasure We're is selling the mine. book. There will, uh, there will be a link to buy the book in the, in the, in the show notes as ever. <laughs> no, the pleasure is all mine because I think that this is like, it's just like uh, giving an example of how um, invested mm. we are in this kind of intellectual um production or play with words or something, uh, like coming back to my yeah. sociological uh, um, upbringing, that is clearly might be, but I think it's very patronizing way of thinking about it, but like still might be uh, considered as a bit weird uh, for the people who are not part of this particular social world. Or like, but it might be like, you know, why to chant these words, why to write it, uh, uh, why to work on this art and so on and so forth. Well, listen. That, that's a, that's a good question. Let let let's let's get let's get to it. Maybe as a, as a way to finish our conversation about the book, because there is, I kind of hate to be this person who wants who wants something positive at the end. Quite uh-huh. often in the book, you see the subtitle which ends with "and what to do about it." You you don't you you no you don't actually. You just say living and working in the precarious art world. There's no there's no promise. But one of the things that does come across between your different entries is the idea of interdependence as a way of thinking about some kind of a solution. I mean, I'm not asking for a breakthrough. We already agreed that we're not saving the world here. But if we, if we were to package, package the learning of, of, of these observations as a, as a takeaway, what can the art world actually do for the rest of the world from this kind of <laughs> deep end? Forget, forget community art. Having analyzed the dirt of the art world, what can what can we tell the rest of the world about it, about <laughs> no, the future? Clearly, I don't know. Possibly, you know more. I don't know. You know, like <laughs> this is not my task here. Like when I wrote about the notion about like the the thing with interdependence, this was uh, this was uh, the to cover an amazing mm. work of uh, people in feminist economies or like community economies, like a lot of different cooperatives. Most of them do not have anything uh, to do with art. Then uh, it's basically community economies research network operated by JK, by Katrin Gibson and others, mm-hmm. uh, who in fact, um, an international network uh, that uh, kind of collates quite a lot of these different cooperatives and um, collectives or like uh, you know some of them like operating in uh, i don't know dismantling mattresses in australia some others being farmers collectives in bolivia like a lot of Mm. people who work uh, by trying to establish various cooperatives to somehow try to live uh, like decent and um 
and sensible life in the world that definitely uh, does not promote decency and uh, and sense uh, or uh, good wages for workers. So possibly this would uh, this would sound. Uh, some of uh, my radical comrades might sound that this sounds like awfully reformist, but I think on the other hand, uh, people just do try to get by. And I think that this is not only to get by, but also to get by by not hurting others, by the recognizing the kind of like uh, interdependencies, trying to act upon them, and uh, seriously uh, thinking about establishing uh, alternatives. Some, some of mm-hmm. this um, might involve art. Uh, some of these might involve varied forms of creativity that uh, possibly the art world would never call art, uh, which I think is also very patronizing. I do applaud these forms of uh, activities and also think that they are very important in terms of how people do need to organize in the kind of larger setting. Because if everybody runs individually from one project to another, there is no platform to communicate or to, as to maintain mm. connections, to build trust. Then, uh, then we are all in this kind of like atomized uh, dog its dog uh, world uh, from which only fittest and already privileged uh, somehow benefit. And uh, that's why I also think that this kind of like forms of stabilization of uh, like cooperativism may be better uh, are pretty important, even though, of course, it's always, as I try also to say in this book, it is impossible to establish socialism in one project, full stop. Impossible. You can make it. You can try to make it more equal. You can try to make it uh, less parasitical. You can try to make it less exploitative. You can try to make it uh, maybe most and of all more fair to everybody involved and also to the communities with whom you operate. Uh, but clearly, in order to change the uh, systemic uh, arrangements, you need also systemic forces, uh, uh, and this is the main problem. Uh, it's not the knowledge. We know we have the knowledge. The problem is that uh, the forces with whom left um, linked people could uh, align are very, very weak, both in terms of politics, unions, and other uh, and other social movements. And yet they are existent, and some things are being uh, uh, done. And still, I think that um, there is this uh, good relation between cooperativists, uh, between community center, between different forms of like nascent commons mm. and this kind of like movements that can be, uh, that can address things uh, on the, in a systemic perspective. Brilliant. I'm definitely not going to argue with you and I'm going to nod and agree that the art world isn't going to save the world. <laughs> I'm oh, no. so sorry. So sorry. No. I'm just I, kind I of, I, I'm, I mean... don't want to put words in your mouth too much, but I think the, the project through which I knew your name is, and you, we, we referred to it earlier was a project called Company Drinks by, run by the artist Kathleen Boom, with whom you have collaborated. I think this is another thing to maybe for listeners to check out in the vein of cooperation and community alternatives that are on the fringes of the art world to the extent that actually they don't rely on the art world at all to still produce interesting social formations. And to end, Kuba, I don't really want to ask you this, but I think your book, really, the title really, really demands it. What is your next project? Ah. My next project, the one I mean, I think like you just like so so many projects already, but I just uh, I forgotten what I uh, what I was doing like you know the day before. Now like uh, a couple of things I'm uh, busy with. Maybe we actually work on the, you're talking about interdependence. Currently, mm-hmm. uh, just actually in the sort of nowish, uh, we are working with Katrin, uh, uh, who you've uh, mentioned on a uh, manifesto of interdependent art worlds. Uh, let's say, let's see how oh, wow. this uh, one work out. It definitely is not the art world. It would be something even maybe actually we shouldn't even uh, uh, write the notion art there. But then a couple of exhibitions. I also work with, of course, teaching. Possibly the next uh, uh, book I would like to think about uh, is something on aesthetics and uh, something more related to, not aesthetics, because in this book, this book, focuses entirely on, or like mostly, on the social structures of artistic production. Uh, which is its also limitation, but it might be, uh, it's its focus at least. And then mm-hmm. um, it might be interesting to think what is the role of artistic imagination in all these struggles that we are having, though I also definitely subscribe to your uh, overarching um, and kind of debunking of the art, uh, art world's claims, <laughs> or claims of the, some of the people uh, in the art world. I also don't think that the art would save the uh, world 
uh, if we were to believe that artists are about to save the world, we are already doomed, I think. You know, then... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, then some think, of us uh, are doomed. Some of us, the, know, the artists might not be doomed, but... Yeah, doomed and but, gloomed. But, yeah. then, but I think, still think, and I, feel, still, I, I give, like, uh, I think that... Uh, Art like or like artistic or cool, some sort of like forms of imagination are very, very, are still important. Maybe because I'm in it, uh, but still I think that, um, and they do not necessarily come from artists, I think they do also emerge in a lot of different uh, situations. And by uh, many, uh, by many uh, people, not necessarily professional artists, but then I think that also professional artists do have the um, hands in it. Fantastic. Kupat, thank you. I, I think looking towards aesthetics of, of, of political organizing, of, of, of aesthetics in general, frankly, the return to aesthetics is something that I, I definitely sub subscribe to. So I'm, send me your, your cash app address on your, on your Venmo and I'll, I'll donate to your next project quite happily. Oh, oh. Kupat, <laughs> thank you for joining me. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me here. The ABC of the Projectariat, Living and Working in a Precarious Art World by Kuba Schroeder is published by Manchester University Press. I'm Pierre Valencer and the editor is Marshall Poe. Thank you for listening and join us next time.